Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you all today to our panel, Louis Althusser and Materialist Reading. My name is Drew Jane, and I will be chairing today's session. Um, we have three panels, the great panels today, Alia Ansari, who is a PhD student um, candidate in the program in comparative literature at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Um, and she has a graduate minor in moving image media and sound studies. Teal McGloon is a PhD student um, in the philosophy graduate program at Villanova University. Um, he is also an editor at Neg uh, Negation Magazine. And then we have Samuel Mercer, um, who is Um, Samuel Mercer is a lecturer in social policy at Liverpool Hope University. Um, his much anticipated book will be coming out from the HM book series. Um, and I actually don't have the name on me right now. Sorry about that, Sam. But Sam will remind you all um, in a, uh, at the beginning of this chat, but it will be coming out either this year or next year. Um, I would like to just start by um, point, uh, just that this is uh, pointing out that this is the second um, part of what uh, of a panel series that we had proposed for the HM conference um, in November. The first was a roundtable on recent scholarship um, on Louis Althusser. So we have some amazing speakers like Pania de Sotiris, Natalia Roma, um, William Lewis, and Stefano Pipa. Um, and that is available uh, to view on YouTube. So please go and check that out. But this is the second part of that. And this wasn't able to be included in the HM conference just because of space and logistics. And the HM was very kind to say, um, uh, to offer us the opportunity to um, broadcast this panel later. And this is what we're doing today. And I'd really like to thank the Historical Materialism Editorial Board and the HM conference organizers and now the broadcast. Um, whatever group body of HM is organizing these um, live streams, because this is a real contribution to the um, scholarship um, that we need so need in these um, times. Um, so th this panel comes actually out of a reading group, which has been running for the last approximately two years, um, of which Tommy, Alia, um, Sam, myself, and several others are involved in. We, um, informally have named ourselves the Altazer support group. And what we've been doing is been reading a lot of the, um, a lot of Altazer students, um, especially in the period of the 1980s, um, 70s and 80s. So people like Pierre Machere, Etienne Balabar, et cetera. And that's sort of been the focus of that reading group. And some of the presentations I think that are being given today come out of the kind of conversations that we've been having in that reading group for the last two years. And it really speaks to this kind of constant recurrence of interest in Louis Althusser. And I think that it's worth pointing out that, you know, I first came to HM to give a presentation on Althusser as a young graduate student. And it really was a formative experience for me. I learned so much about Althusser at the HM conference and in the, the journal itself, which you should all make sure to get library subscriptions for, um, for your um, home institutions. Um, I learned so much about uh, Louis Althusser at these conferences and at the end of the journal, and, but it also was a space for young scholars to meet a, a, um, a different generation of scholarship, like um, scholars who uh, played a uh, pivotal role in my mentorship. And I'm really glad that you know, people like Alia and people like Tommy are getting to do their presentations here as well, because I know that it'll be, of such a, it'll be a similarly formative space for them. And uh, Sam, of course, is, um, uh, is already a lecturer, so I'm hoping that this will be the beginnings of a much more sustained in, um, engagement with, between him and the journal as well, um, and the conferences. So, um, you know, I'm really excited about this afternoon and I'm going to, um, this evening, and I'm going to leave it, I'm going to hand it over to the panelists. So first, we're going to start with Alia. Hi, thank you for that very kind introduction, Dhruv. And again, many thanks to everybody on Historic Materialism for making this happen. Um, and many thanks to the broadcast audience um, who I'm sure you're out there somewhere. I can't see you, but I, I must believe. Um, so on that note, I have on fairly good authority that it is expected for one to show up to one's panel with an entirely different paper to present as promised. <laughs> and so unlike what was initially advertised, 
In what follows, I hope to provide some preliminary and fragmentary, but hopefully explanatory notes in response to one of Althusser's many prefatory queries in the opening chapter of the expanded edition of Reading Capital. Specifically, I hope to demonstrate the action of a theoretical practice which attempts to chart, quote, the mechanism by which the production of the object of knowledge produces the cognitive appropriation of the real object which exists outside thought in the real world, end quote. Put differently, in this presentation, I will attempt to mobilize the deconstruction already at work in the work of Marx's capital by providing account of the semiotic mechanisms by which the concept of surplus value produces a cognitive appropriation of the logic of infinite self-valorization while simultaneously disappearing its material referent. Not unlike Marx, who, quote, interrogated a given society as a result in order to pose it the question of its society effect or of the question of the mechanism which produces its existence as a society, end quote, I interrogate the concept of surplus value, a concept of Marx's own production, in order to pose it the question of its knowledge effect or the question or of the question of the mechanism which produces its existence as this concept and not any other. In the, in the interest of time, I will only present the primary intervention subordinated to my driving line of inquiry. To unpick the mechanism by which the operation of the concept surplus value disappears its material referent. Mobilizing Jill Zulu's concept of expression and Louis Althusser's conception of knowledge effects, I attempt to bear the mechanisms of cognitive appropriation that give this specific relation between surplus value as an object of knowledge and as a real object or set of objects in material reality. Animating this research is Althusser's account of the knowledge effect, introduced as an operation of capital's metonymic or structural causality that, as an imminent effect of an absent cause, quote, gives the non-posing of the problem as its solution, end quote. That is to say, the knowledge produced as a result of the mechanism of cognitive appropriation by which concepts come into view has the tautological quality of self-referentiality, wherein the concept, by reference to itself, forecloses the possibility of questioning the mechanism of its production. <clears throat> we know this method otherwise is symptomatic reading. Classed as both ideological and scientific, the knowledge effect produced at the level of the forms of order of discourse of proof simultaneously appropriates the real object ideologically in the surface of capital self-effacement and scientifically in the theoretical production of the mechanism of the, concept, of the concept's ideological conceit. My contention, at least preliminarily, is that this twofold operation of the knowledge effect is an indication of capital's discursive modalization in its operation is in what Reiner Schooner Sherman has called a quote, epochally ultimate principle, the governing ontic origin which reduces any given historical epoch to the way that things, words, and actions are mutually manifest in it. Given its twofold ideological and scientific character, untangling the operation of the concept of surplus value as it contributes to the critique of political economy or its scientific knowledge effect, from the operation of the concept of surplus value as it works us over in order to reify the epochal dominance of the capitalist mode of production, which would be its ideological knowledge effect, reveals the corpus of knowledge that constitutes our understanding of the complex totality of the capitalist mode of production as not merely a form which becomes occupied with the substance of being, as one might expect orange juice when poured into a fishbowl to appear fishbowl shaped but rather as a Klein bottle whose interiority is simultaneously and incessantly revealed as its very exteriority. Orange juice and fishbowl in a complex interrelation of indiscrete continuity that annihilates the distinction between discourse and reality. How is it then that surplus value enforces the discursive and epistemological limits of the capitalist regime whose valorizing principle disposes political horizons of efficacy and possibility? And how does the production of surplus value as such an apocalyptic reinforcing representation, expose the self-effacing nature of the capitalist mode of production, which necessitates the obfuscation of its material origins in violent exploitation, expropriation, and dispossession. Such queries are elaborated when considering the indispensable role that the concept of surplus value plays in the internally violent structure by which the capitalist mode of production establishes and maintains itself as apocalyptic ultimate and legally determinant. 
In his representative dimension, surplus value it excavates a more intrinsic structure of the capitalist mode of production, quote, in the sense of law that would maintain a more internal complex relation to what calls force, power, or violence. That is to say, for the apocal principle to, do, to dispose itself ontically, which is to say ep epochally ultimately, its establishing violence must be presenced. This violence must both appear and disappear, an absent cause imminent in its own effects, reifying the law while simultaneously effacing its violent origin. However, while all ep epochally ultimate principles are dependent upon appositing, the violent institution of power relations and its attendant political, economic, social, and cultural spheres of influence, in such violent, violent positing inheres the tendency to impede, deny, and compromise itself. Violence, and we know this from both Walter Benjamin and Jacques Derrida, when put in service of the preservation of the law that it has posited, must oppose all forces of other positing and turns indirectly against its own principle. In so doing, the positing violence of the epochal principle collides with itself in its preserving form and must disintegrate. Derrida offers a generative demonstration of such self-compromise in his analysis of the legal contract, which as a representation of the positing violence of the law, in the words of Werner Hamaker, quote, splits off from the positing and abandons itself to the preservation of its status, end quote. Any epochal principle, once manifest in a representation which has detached itself from what it represents, is powerless in that it no longer in that it is no longer epochally ultimate with regard to the autonomous operation of this law-preserving representation. Such is the structure of any positing, quote, dethroned by its internal reversal into a positive representation, which is its immediate self-alienation, end quote. Consequently, any representation of the epochal principle must be oriented towards itself, towards its own repositing, necessitated by the preserving action of representation itself. In other words, infinite valorization as the epochally ultimate principle of our current historical conjuncture must be represented as the product of its own logic in order for valorization to continuously reposit itself as the epochally ultimate principle. Such representation is indispensable in facing the mystical foundation of capital's valorizing authority, which at the moment of its violent establishment, quote, could not have itself authorized itself by any interior legitimacy and, and in this initial moment is neither legal nor illegal, end quote. The apocalypse ultimate leg legitimacy of capital cannot by definition rest on anything but itself, itself violence without ground. The conceptually tautological representation of infinite self-valorization in the immaterial sign of surplus value, a sign which circulates freely in even the most exacting and critical discourses, is precisely so in order to prevent the questioning of capital's epochal legitimacy as anything other than given. Its syllogistic function ensures that the capitalistic epochal principle, which determines the modes, conditions, and relations of production, are not directly manifest in the sign function of the concept, and therefore must be excavated obliquely. Consider the structure of surplus value as linguistic sign, a double entity formed by the association of two terms, which gives us the internal unity of the sign surplus value as produced by the structuring relation between signifier and signified. That is to say, in Saussurian terms, the sound image surplus value is tethered to the concept of infinite self ameliorization of value, which together designate the sign surplus value. But what is the indexical function of this sign? In what ways did it establish a relationship between its concept and its referent? In what ways did the sign surplus value account for the processes by which value is produced, exchanged, and reproduced in the form of its own valorization? Unlike material signs, which are material precisely by the way that they remain half sheathed in the object, or put differently, explicable through, the, through indicative allusion to their material referent, the concept of surplus value does not enable a recognition of the violent processes of exploitation, appropriation, or dispossession, which are required of the economic base in order to produce surplus value, either in the form of expendable value, which comprises this ideological knowledge effect, or in the discursive terms of the literary overproduction required to develop its scientific knowledge effect. But that concept of which the science surplus value is sound image, infinite self-valorization, cannot be empirically given in material reality. However, recalling the image of the Klein bottle, the specific structure of the, of the concept of surplus value also gives indication for the deposing of epochal principles, 
for the capitalist mode of production's ontic origins are founded upon interpretable and transformable textual strata and are, there, and are therefore by definition unfounded. Such law, therefore deconstructible, and is so precisely by the, that ultimate critical mediacy whose nullification is achieved by this ideological knowledge effect of the concept of surplus value, language. Language is that medium which cannot be measured as an objective state of affairs or verifiable, verifiable independently of itself, gives access to a deposing purely violent force which articulates immediacy prior to any distinction between true and false, and is therefore not subject to that distinction. Such deposing is precisely what enables such interrogation of the discursive formation of surplus value in this reification of the principle of valorization as a popular ultimate. For language does not transgress its own internal logics, but undermines the use of such logics to produce out effects outside of itself. Such criticism undermines the appearance of the concept surplus value as representing a merely mimetic relationship between sound image and concept with no legible indexical function, and instead reveals the expressive function, function of the concept of surplus value that articulates the reifying relationship between the violence of the mode of production, the concept, uh, the ide ideological effect of the concept of surplus value, and the epochally dominant principle of valorization, which capital must posit as an end outside of itself. The regime of representation, while providing us with an opportunity to wrench into view the internally violent structure of capital's hegemony, only ever produced an analytic account of the external, and that is to say, scientifically unsound, but ideologically essential, relation between the real object and the mechanism of its cognitive appropriation. Consequently, if we consider surplus value as that representation in which the epochal principle is manifest, in this case, the concept of valorization infinitely, and one in which the limits of the epochal reign of capital are enforced by structural necessity, surplus value is referent for surplus value, it begins to become evident how the continued dominance of this principle is reliant on the self-effacement of its conditions of production, both material and discursive. The concept surplus value guarantees this self-effacement because it appears superficially as a sign whose material referent is readily available in an empirical reality for our inspection, such as profit, wealth, money, while simultaneously appearing as a product of a process that can only be understood conceptually. Surplus value has to be executed, in other words, as the action of a com commanding RK, which disposes our present capitalist conjuncture according to an order of coercion, which is to say the coercion of endless self-valorizing reproduction, and which appears as perverted into a referent, as the ideological knowledge effect of recognition misrecognition that obtains to the natural mimetic structure of thought. Such application recalls Althusser's warning that it would be absolutely wrong to take the descriptive style of some of the terms and concepts or the direct simplicity, simplicity with which Marx presents them as a pretext for believing them to be given in immediate experience and of obvious significance. And so what I've endeavored to do in this fragmentary presentation has been to engage a theoretical practice cognizant of the challenges posed by the, by the ideological knowledge effect of surplus value which secures the discursive elision of the material conditions of production necessary for the reproduction of the capitalist mode of production, even as the concept surplus value was necessarily produced uh, by Marx to inform the critique of political economy. What this wrenches into view, recalling Althusser's query that asks after, quote, the mechanism by which the production of the object of knowledge produces the cognitive appropriation of the real object, which exists outside thought in the world, is at least one dimension of the ideological mechanism by which the cognitive appropriation of scientific concepts within the literary mode of production, as determined by the economic mode of production, is rendered inadequate by design to the real object. Furthermore, this research explains how the mechanism of such cognitive appropriation is in service of the capitalist mode of production's continued ontic dominance and the reification of its imminent epochal, epochal authority. It is my hope that the development of this research as distinct from analysis of the historical conditions of production of knowledge, and particularly the ways in which it moves beyond while remaining indebted to Althusser's progr pro programmatic ambition of symptomatic reading, offers an entirely new frame of reference through which to approach the reading of capital and the logics are that I have, as I've already previously indicated, already at work in the work. Thank you. Thank you for that, Alia. That was um, a really thoughtful presentation and I appreciate the fact that you maintained time discipline. Um, 
Next up is um, um, Tommy. So please go ahead. Thanks, Drew. Um, so just very quickly, I'd like to thank uh, everybody at HM, uh, my fellow presenters, Drew, for really putting this together um, for all of us. Um, the Altasair <laughs> support group that Drew mentioned at the top of this, as well as um, specifically Alia, Will Cheney, uh, Ben Wallace, and Brian Niddle for their participation in a reading capital discussion group where I developed uh, some of these ideas. Uh, their feedback to an early version of this talk was really very helpful for me. So I'll just jump in. Reading Capital is in many ways a uh, confusing text in the history of contemporary Marxist thought. Many concepts contained in the two chapters of the book written by Louis Althusser are still being explored, debated, and reimagined by philosophers and social scientists today in the current uh, so-called second reception of Althusser's work. You can see this term used by uh, Stefano Pippa, uh, Dave Messing, Vittorio Morfino, among others. Um, the other entries in Reading Capital, though, written by Althusser's young students, have had more varied fates, uh, generally speaking. Etienne Balibar's chapter on the basic concepts of historical materialism was included alongside Althusser's chapters in the original English translation of the text and played a crucial role in many sociological arguments of the 1970s around the concept of the mode of production. However, many of the other essays in the original text, the complete edition was published in English only in 2016, I believe, have received far less close attention. And Balabar's essay, though well known, has been returned to only infrequently in the recent wave of work on Althusser. The contemporary view of the non-Althusser reading capital essays is complicated by the relations of the writers to their essays. Balabar's essay was received with controversy in uh, ang mostly anglophone social sciences. Uh, Jacques Ranciere disavowed his contribution more or less entirely, I think a couple years after it came out. Uh, Roger Estable has not made uh, any substantial or, or sustained returns to his contribution. And Pierre Macheret has qualified his contribution as a working sketch uh, characterized by incompleteness and indefinite conclusions. This was in a crisis and critique interview, I think from, I guess, six or seven years ago now, maybe. The essays also differ in object and methods from more recent works by Rancière, Balabar, and Macheret, though at the same time, each essay by Althusser students at times breaks quite obviously with the most commonplace concepts of Althusserian thought, containing complications and unexamined problems which have little to do with the Althusserian Anglophone theoretical debates of the 1970s. So in this talk, I'll address a concept in Reading Capital, which I think remains uh, at least under-examined, that of uh, décollage. The term, variably translated as discrepancy and dislocation, though it can also be rendered as gap or lag, among other things, has some purchase as a term of art among Althusser scholars and was featured frequently in Althusserian film theory literature in, in the late uh, 1960s and early to mid-1970s, for example. However, it has in reality received only a mere fraction of the intention and usage of other major Althusserian concepts uh, like overdetermination or structural causality, and little systematic comment more significant than Ben Brewster's definition of the concept in uh, his famous glossary to reading capital. So I'll start by outlining how Machere develops the concept prior to and within reading capital. I will then discuss how Machere's notion of décollage can help us understand historical misreadings of Balabar's essay in reading capital. So to fully understand Machere's essay in Reading Capital, it's helpful to first examine a 1964 essay on George Kangolem's philosophy of science and history, which contains early versions of Machere's arguments in Reading Capital. In the essay entitled George Kangolem's Philosophy of Science, Epistemology and History of Science, it is published in English in, in a materialist way. Uh, Machere presents a motivated reading of Kangolem's work, which attempts to outline historical and conceptual explanations for the procession of scientific knowledge. In the essay, Machere argues that a particular notion of scientific process as opposed to progress is absolutely crucial for developing a historical science of history and a scientific history of science. Concepts, he argues, have historically been understood from the vantage point of the scientific theories in which they operate as properly rigorous scientific concepts. However, this view of concepts erases their actual history. Concepts don't progress through history at random until they find their home within a scientific theory perfectly suited for them but instead are able to exist in a variety of elaborate conceptual contexts in which they have distinct meanings before they ever become a component of a systematic scientific theory. 
Kangalam, Mashray argues, provides epistemologists with tools for understanding concepts as having histories prior to and outside of the theory in which they are ultimately rendered consistent. So Mashray contends that instead of relating the history of a concept solely to progression of theories, we can and should separate the origin of a concept from its commencement. A concept appears as a symptom of the presence of a particular question, but it may emerge in a context that's not yet capable of providing scientific responses to that question. A concept can originate without commencing within a field of systematic knowledge, which provides it with rigorous meaning. The concept commences its role within a theory when it forms a part of that theory's knowledge. This doesn't mean that a concept moves from a context in which it is unambiguously false to one where it's affirmatively true, but only that its function and character attain a certain degree of productiveness and consistency within a scientific system that provides a more or less determinate understanding of its object. Importantly, the origin of a concept determines its historical trajectory, but it doesn't determine that the concept is destined for a single commencement within a single field of scientific knowledge. Quote, the origin appears as a choice which determines without containing it the particular history of the concept, end quote. Consequently, a concept can live many lives in many different sciences, as well as many different ideologies. For Machre, the presence of a concept within a scientific theory is not wholly true or perfected because it is in actuality the existence of error and the disparity or decalage between concepts and objective factors, which condition the process of scientific knowledge. This set of discrepancies internal to a science also gives us the means to critique said science, particularly by locating the disparities between a science's nominal intent and the actual functions of its concepts. As Mashray writes, movement of concepts cannot be described on the basis of the ideal presence of the true, but only on the basis of its real absence. The false is not eliminated, instead error is located and resumed found within get the gaps between concepts themselves and between concepts and the objective conditions in which they arise. In his reading capital essay titled On the Process of Exposition of Capital, The Work of Concepts, Mashray once again takes up the problem of the productive decollage between concepts, this time in the context of Marx's capital. Mashray characterizes Marx as a theorist of science in general, in Althusser's terms, a philosopher, and scientific practitioner who evinced a groundbreaking understanding of both scientific practices and the specific economic object of his own critical scientific practice. Marx, Mashray argues, understood science in general and his own scientific practice as intertwined. Quote, no discourse on science before the discourse of science, but the two things together, which does not mean that they are merged. End quote. To reiterate, for Mashray so far, a decollage is an inequality or imbalance between concepts due to their lack of sufficiency within a specific scientific theory. However, by drawing on Marx, who's portrayed as operating both within a general theory, a philosophical theory of knowledge, and a specific scientific theory, the critique of political economy, Mashray is able to expand his definition of decollage. For Marx, Mashray argues, specific concepts operate at different levels of operation within a given text. In capital, a particular concept may operate at the level of Marx's theory of knowledge, science in general, while another may operate within Marx's examination of empirical data or his critique of economic theory, a particular science. Marx's examination of empirical data or his critique of economic theory, a particular science. Sometimes a specific concept may even operate on both levels at once or may have a scientific usage uh, in a text and a non-scientific ideological usage, which is nevertheless instrumental within the process of the text exposition. Uh, the example Mashra uses here is how Marx uses the concept of wealth in the first few pages of Capital. It's ultimately an ideological concept, but it has a use in the scientific context. Contradiction then results from two possible ways of treating the concept, from the possibility of applying it to two different analyses at different levels. For Mashray, concepts operating at different levels of analysis become productive when they confront each other from unequal positions. They respond to one another only to the extent that they are mutually at odds. More general notions may work upon more particular ones and vice versa. Same goes for more ideological and more determinate notions. Concepts consequently do not proceed from one another in a linear way, but, quote, are rubbed against another, end quote. These conceptual interactions also possess a relationship of decollage with the objective context in which they appear, a context Mashray refers to interchangeably as the material and the objective. 
Because objective conditions play a part in this conceptual process, we could easily add that the procession from one mode of analysis to another may in fact rely on the advancement of certain objective processes just as much as conceptual ones. The concept, as Mashray writes, is produced on the basis of other concepts, but, quote, it produces knowledge on the basis of the concept in definite material conditions, end quote. Consequently, the process of knowledge production does not proceed in a formally consistent or smooth manner. Even among the concepts alone, quote, the movement of the analysis is not continuous, but repeatedly interrupted by the questioning of the object, the method, and the means of exposition, end quote. Mashere, remaining consistent with his uh, position in his Kangulam essay, argues that the insufficiency of each concept, either as a concept or in relation to a specific task, allows for a dynamic, nonlinear engagement between concepts, which leads to certain concepts being discarded and others being reshaped entirely. Quote, what determines a moment in the exposition and analysis are the conflicts between the concepts, the breaks between the levels of argumentation. These defects lead the exposition to its conclusion, to the final break, which obliges it to be resumed at a different level, proceeding to a new analysis, end quote. For Mashraya, science cannot come to an end point wherein all its concepts are rendered consistent and a formal method can be unchangingly applied to empirical data. Instead, a science only ever remains generative insofar as its concepts continually work on each other, both within the historical process of investigation, but also in the textual process of exposition. We might briefly comment here. Uh, that at many points, Mashray's understanding of the scientific process appears almost Hegelian, despite the fact that Mashray, uh, like all the reading capital contributors, uh, criticizes Hegelianism uh, frequently, as I'm sure uh, most people watching this are probably aware. Uh, a symptomatic reading of reading capital, which specifically targets its frequently imprecise anti-Hegelian positions, would likely be quite valuable for helping us understand the relation between Mashray's concept of dialectical possession qua décollage and the Hegelian dialectic, as is understood by its most careful and generous Marxist and communist readers today. Certainly, uh, Mashray's emphasis on the productivity of error and conceptual insufficiency, his assertion that the procession of science cannot be understood by resorting to a model of total contingency, and his understanding of scientific practice as the rendering determinant of disordered conceptual elements at least appears to bear some resemblance to certain readings of Hegel, which recognize these same features in both the phenomenology of spirit and the science of logic. Um, in a very classic um, academic style, I guess. I'll just leave this to the side now, <laughs> if only because uh, it's really the sort of project that would require very sustained and careful effort, not just you know a few illusions. Um, but I wanted to at least put it on the table. So I'll move on to Balabar now. Uh, Balabar's essay in Reading Capital provides us with a more concrete, I think, uh, or at least historically pressing or relevant example of why Mashray's epistemological concept of décollage is fundamental for understanding the project of reading capital and the legacy of its chapters within a variety of disciplines of social sciences as, as well as philosophy. Um, in his essay, Reading Capital on the Basic Concepts of Historical Materialism, Balbar makes an ambitious attempt to describe the concepts which he thinks undergird Marx's theory of history. Historically speaking, this essay was taken as Balbar's attempts to uncover the methodological concepts which Marx applied to the locus classicus of capital, England, as Marx refers, um, in order to create his theory of the capitalist mode of production. But this reading is, as I argue in a uh, forthcoming work in the Decollage Journal, um, in an accuracy, one that has caused serious issues for the reading of Balabar's essay. While Balabar does refer to Marx as possessing a theory of history, it's clear that he's not attempting to take from capital a general schema of historical economic analysis, which can be uncritically applied to the Roman Republic as easily as 19th century Britain. On the contrary, Balabar is attempting something essentially different to uncover the philosophical concepts upon which Marx's empirical work depends. The philosophical nature of Balabar's project is quite clear on close reading. Balabar is emphatically critical of those attempting to turn Marx's concept of the capitalist mode of production into a model, writing that for such thinkers, it seems that we need rules to determine which objects and experience fall within the concept of the capitalist mode of production. Quote, it is this apparent necessity which gives rise to the empiricist interpretation of theoretical practice as a practice which constitutes models. In this view, the entire theory of capital is a study of the properties of a model, properties which are valid for every production that is an example or case of the structure. He goes on to say that this 
quote, is a non-theoretical process which depends not on concepts, but on properties of the identifier, properties which might well be called psychological even where a scientific consciousness is concerned, end quote. This is from Reading Capital. For Balbar, it's clear that Marx's key historical economic concepts in capital are not simply empirical models, but must operate at a different level of analysis. Fundamentally, though, what is the distinction that's actually being made here? Uh, why does it matter? Um, I want to go through this carefully. Um, the sociological reading of Balbar's essay ignores his critique of models and takes the text as clarifying a set of concepts such as labor process, relations of production, forces of production, and so on, so that they can be applied to all social formations or societies. In this view, Balabar understands capital as a work of social science in the colloquial sense, and the concepts which Marx employs are consequently social scientific by nature. This isn't Balabar's argument, as Balabar has a far more complex idea of what Marx is doing in the text of Capital, a complex idea that's intrinsically linked, I think, to Machere's notion of décollage. Remember Machere's distinction between varying levels of concepts which dynamically interact with one another in order to produce scientific knowledge. Machere identifies two levels in Capital, that of science in general and that of a particular science. However, it's hardly a leap to suggest that the levels internal to a work as complex as capital would not simply be binary and that Marx's concepts of knowledge in general may themselves be interacting with a specific science which itself contains subordinate levels of operation. To put it simply, the most blunt empirical tools Marx uses to analyze the facts of existence under capitalism must themselves have a relation to another order of concepts which mediates the differences between the immediacy of empirical analysis and the abstract concepts appropriate to Marx's philosophical concept of knowledge. It's this mediating level which contains concepts that are necessary presuppositions for Marx's scientific endeavor though they don't function as sociological models, which can be cleanly extricated from Marx's work. In fact, we can go so far, probably, I would say, as to argue that for Balbar qua Machere, it is because Marx's project sustains a series of conflictual but productive relations between these varying levels of concepts that he falls neither into accrued empiricism, which views applying models as the task of scientific work, nor into a form of abstraction, in which the work of concepts upon concepts is not cognizant of the ways in which it is itself imminent within a changing set of objective conditions. Well, Machere's analysis focuses on how Marx uses décollage uh, between different forms of concepts to determine capital's exposition, the book capital's exposition. Uh, Balabar shows how a particular set of concepts, mode of production, relations of production, labor process, et cetera, operate at a crucial mediating level and form an essential part of Marx's overall effort to outline the abstract movement and form of capital. The impact of Mashray's argument is now clear. If Marx's endeavors and capital are only productive because they play different forms of concepts off of one another in order to provide an analysis and critique of economic theory and capital itself, then any attempt to reduce his work to a purely spiritual philosophy or a rote, rote, rote uh, analytic sociology is necessarily performing an infidelity to the project of capital itself. The unique unique conceptual power of capital for both Machere and Balabar can be found in its ability to mediate disparate forms of analysis, to understand the necessary oppositions between deviating concepts while at the same time holding them together in a unity that is simultaneously conflictual and productive. The notion of décollage as Machere presents it also provides a step towards understanding how the concepts of political economy take on a new form in Marx's critical work and how changes in theoretical context can reshape concepts more generally. Machere's insistence on highlighting the way in which conceptual disparities are responsible for the passage of a concept from one body of knowledge to another can help us understand the shifting history of a concept while recognizing the fundamental consistency of the questions said concept addresses. To take an example that may have been to Althusser's liking, the concept of fortune appears in ancient Roman society as a goddess to the Christian philosopher Boethius as an anthropomorphic figure obscuring human access to divine wisdom, and to Machiavelli as a problem of political knowledge and action. In each problematic, the question posed by the idea of fortune remains relatively consistent. How do we ascribe an order to and make normative sense of events which appear due to causes we are unable to comprehend? Yet for each of these thinkers, the specific way in which the question is proposed differs drastically, due in part to uh, objective conditions and relations, that's just a basic historical materialist principle, but also due to the conceptual content in which the idea of fortune is made to speak. 
What Mashri's perspective provides is an argument against the presentation of historical pro uh, progress of knowledge as a succession of theories and an argument in favor of knowledge's history as a processual moment of concepts which appear in many different contexts, sometimes ideological, sometimes scientific, but only find themselves rendered consistent when they're operative in a specific scientific theory. It's in theories of this kind that conflicts between concepts are able to become productive, to create knowledge which adequately relates to the concrete reality of objective processes, even if this adequation is never a fully realized or static perfection. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy, for that group uh, presentation. Um, next up is um, Samuel Mercer. Thank you, Drew, and thank you, Tommy and Alia and everyone at Historical Materialism for including me in this panel. I feel like it's an undeserved privilege to be able to speak about Alta's air here. And uh, yeah, a shout out to the to the support group as well, from whom I've learned uh, a great deal, um, more than I can put into words, actually. Um, okay, so um, in this paper, I would like to complete a reading of uh, the ideology of work across the works of Louis Althusser in order to demonstrate a persistent problem within the theory of ideology that is presented within the sociology of work. And the paper focuses on two important reflections by Althusser on this topic, written at similar times. One in his uh, 1967 essay, The Humanist Controversy, and one in his 1968 manuscript on the reproduction of capitalism. So following Montague, um, it could be argued that presented in these two examples are two quite different theories of ideology, the former analysing ideology as a theoretical problem and the latter analysing ideology as a problem of state apparatuses. But I would like to argue that privileging the concepts of work and labour facilitates the separation of these two readings insofar as these concepts rely on theoretically humanist separation between intellectual and manual labour, the labour of thought and the labor of action. However, in making a theoretically anti-humanist shift away from labor and work towards the concept of production, I argue that it becomes possible to read these two texts together and to draw from them the philosophical potential that such a reading offers. My argument is that privileging the concepts of work and labor over the concept of production within sociology reproduces a theory of ideology which implicitly separates these readings and produces the precise theoretical lacking which repeatedly undermines its ability to analyze the social relations of work. So my argument here is based upon something that I read in Natalia Rome's uh, brilliant book, uh, For Theory. Um, and in it, Rome argues that, quote, if a specifically Althusserian problematic can be spoken of, it is, due to, uh, it is due to this perseverance in thinking jointly about that which by definition may not be joined. And it's in this context that Rome thinks about the persistent distinction in thought between intellectual and manual labor and how the collapse of this distinction was important to Althusser's philosophy. According to Rome, one of the important concepts utilized by Althusser in doing this was the concept of production. And this concept allowed him to critique, critique, quote, the idealist notion of practice as an immediate relationship to the real to show that the most corporeal images, those of mechanic materialism, empiricism of direct pure action, um, are constitutive elements of the inner world profiled by idealist discourse structure. So the characteristic feature of this idealist tendency against which Althusser was struggling was the separation of intellectual and manual labor, the quote, dichotomy that separates pure theory as vision and pure practice as manual labor. Hidden behind the separation of intellectual and manual labor is quote, the inherent complexity of real uh, human relations to the world where neither the theory nor the practice could be found isolated from one another. The concept of production found in Marx and read by Althusser is here useful because, quote, as a practice, production is irreducible to the image of an immediate relationship to the real because it is irreducible to a simple dyadic relation between hand and nature. All those quotes come from Rome. And it's for this same reason that Etienne Balibar, in his own analysis of the concept of production in his text, The Philosophy of Marx, sees within it the opening up of an important philosophical space by Marx. Balabar observes in the concept of production a theoretically anti-humanist shift in the way in which the relationship between the subjective and the objective is observed. According to Balabar, Marx shifts away from the concept of praxis, which implies the existence a priori of a subject who acts upon objective reality, 
towards the concept of production, which implies a more imminent co-constitutive relation between the subjective and the objective contained in the idea of the social relations of production. And with this shift, the prioritization of the subject is removed and the relationship between the subjective and the objective can no longer be explained through consciousness. And therefore, Marx must necessarily introduce, quote, a question unprecedented in philosophy, the question of ideology. So in this move, according to Balabar, Marx uh, demonstrates that it's ideology that is the force that binds individual subjects in their confrontation with the material conditions of their existence, and that this ideology springs from those material conditions that they themselves work upon and are worked upon by uh, those subjects. Crucially, with this move, Marx opens up a space for philosophy. The question then, as Balabar puts it, um, quote, uh, is no longer to denounce the abstraction of universals, of generalities, or of idealities by showing that the abstraction substitutes itself for real individuals. So this is obviously the idea that subjects merely need to engage in the labor of seeing through or becoming conscious of abstractions uh, in order that their material work be their own. But rather, it now becomes possible to study the genesis of those abstractions, their production by individuals as a function of the collective or social conditions in which they think and relate to one another. That's a quote from Balabar. So it's in the context of this problem of the separation of intellectual and manual labor, posed and solved by the concept of production and the question of ideology, that I wish to read Althusser's reflections on the ideology of work. So written at similar times, these reflections can be read across two texts in particular, the humanist controversy and on the reproduction of capitalism. They appear to present two separate, uh, two different explanations of the ideology of work, with the former focusing on the expression of this ideology in theory, and the latter its refre reflection in practice. The very act of separating these two texts resurrects the separation between intellectual and manual labour. However, following Rome, I would like to demonstrate how the concept of production permits the reading of these two texts together and opens up a philosophical space that facilitates Althusser's materialist critique of work and labour. So in the humanist controversy, Althusser's target is what he calls ideologies of labor, described as a theoretical problem consisting in, quote, all the idealist interpretations of Marxism as a philosophy of labor. Althusser is here focused on the problem which sees labor as the essential activity of the human subject, as the sole act of the subjective upon the objective and the interpretation of social relations as things into which these subjects deliberately enter. As Althusser writes, uh, this formulation, quote, reactivates the ideological notion of labor against the background provided by the following theoretical complex, essence of man equals labor or social labor, which equals the creation of man by man, which equals man subject of history, which equals history as a process whose subject is man or human labor. In the place of the concept of production, Althusser argues that instead there is only the concept of social labor in which, quote, everything that is social designates not the structure of social conditions and the labor process or the process of the realization of value, but the externalization or alienation of an originary essence, man. So in reading Marx, Althusser demonstrates that nowhere in his mature works is Marx interested in an idea of labor that merely describes the immediate direct empirical relationship between the human subject and the objective world. Rather, when Marx speaks of labor, he attempts to describe a complex arrangement of relations which do not indicate the simple dyad between act the activity of the human subject and the appearance of the objective world, but rather the complicated encounter between a number of different relations at the point of production. As Althusser writes, quote, the concept of labor, when it explodes, breaks down into the following concepts, labor process, the structure of the social conditions of the labor process, labor power, the value of labor power, concrete labor, abstract labor, the utilization of labor power, the quantity of labor, and so on. It's the complexity of social relations that Marx attempts to convey in this operation, as, quote, the word labor in these expressions does not refer to a basic concept that is theoretically prior, and thus scientific in and of itself, the concept of labor, but rather to a new complex set of concepts of which he provides a, sh a brief list. So for Althusser, contained within this focus on labor are the implications of the concept of production itself as a theoretically anti-humanist concept. Marx moves away from a simple conceptualization of labor as merely human activity to a complex articulation of labor as the descriptor of a set of specific social relations of production. 
where praxis had attempted to understand the separation between human and animal activity through an emphasis on human reason and deliberate action. The shift towards production demonstrates, quote, that the feature distinguishing the forms of existence of the human species from those of animal species is not social labor, but the structure of the production and reproduction of the existence of social formations. That is the social relations that preside over the mobilization of labor power in the labor process together with all their effects. So man cannot be defined by labor alone um, uh, as the expression either of theoretical or manual labor, rather it's quote, the encounter of several distinct, definite, indispensable elements within the mode of production that contains the answer to this question, where this separation between thought and action is simply impossible. It's for this reason that Althusser says, quote, in order to think the nature of labor, one has to begin by thinking the, uh, the structure of the social conditions or social relations in which it is mobilized. Moving to his text uh, on the reproduction of capitalism, Althusser speaks instead of an ideology of work, defined primarily as an ideology of the capitalist class struggle. Uh, in this reading, ideology is observed in its function within the factory as an ideological state apparatus, as a force which interpolates workers into their positions and as such, quote, makes the workers go. For Althusser, this ideology of work is responsible for the social arrangement of workers in such a way that facilitates their continued exploitation. It's an ideology imminent to the point of production itself in a material dynamic that Althusser describes as production exploitation. Though at first glance it appears that Althusser's problematic here is different from that of the humanist controversy, the problem of the ideology of work can be argued to begin as a theoretical one. The treatment of labor as something which is essentially a human activity is shown here to be something upon which capitalism itself relies in order to arrange workers and facilitate their exploitation. For example, by treating work in this way, capitalism is able to deploy a very particular division of labor, which it justifies as a technical division of labor. Althusser argues that the differential exploitation of labor power is hidden beneath an economistic humanist ideology of work, which says that the differential arrangement of workers within the production process is related to the technical skills possessed by those individuals and the differential ability and dexterity of individual human subjects in confronting and transforming objective materials. It's a theory of labor rooted in the human subject and the notion that labor is an expression of the subjective will to act upon objective conditions. Under capitalism, this view is forwarded in order to argue that, quote, only purely technical phenomena occur in the production process a purely technical division of labor, a purely technical organization of labor, and a purely technical management of labor. What Althusser seeks to demonstrate is the fact that, quote, the technical division of labor is quite simply a mask hiding the fact that some people are permanently penned in the situation of the working class, a demonstration which reveals the social relations of production in all of their complexity. So the concept of production emerges here again for Althusser. By shifting once more from the notion of practice to one of production, Althusser demonstrates labor to be the expression of a complexity of social relations. Quote, the forms of class struggle, unconscious and conscious, that obtain within the process of production alone are complex in the extreme. Production does not depend on the consciousness either of the capitalist or proletarian, rather the expenditure of uh, and exploitation of labor power and the class struggle reflected in this is responsible for the imminent production of subjectivity itself. As Althusser argues, quote, the workers' class struggle in production does not unfold all by itself. It's rooted in and takes shape in exceedingly harsh day-to-day -day realities of exploitation, of the experience of exploitation. Crucially, this experience is not the humanist empirical experience of labor as an essential activity of the subject, but an experience itself produced by the encounter between the ensemble of relations that make up the mode of production. What Althusser demonstrates across these two reflections on the ideology of work is that work and labor as concepts privilege and reproduce a separation between intellectual and manual labor, a separation which welcomes the ideological figure of the laboring human subject to take center stage. This subject takes the stage in theory at the end of history waiting, quote, to welcome the individuals to the freedom whose concept he has been from the very start, or in the factory itself, quote, as a museum piece exhibited to encourage belief in the possibility of the impossible and the idea that there are no social classes. 
By shifting to the concept of production and prioritizing the ensemble of social relations responsible for the arrangement and production of subjectivity itself, a properly materialist, and materialist analysis of work and labor becomes available. The social relations responsible for the exploitation of labor power, the organization of the labor process, the interpolation of workers as subjects, and so on. The collapse of the distinction between intellectual and manual labor is the precondition for the material analysis of labor overall. So the conclusion I wish to draw from this is that production is the necessary concept that ties these two readings together. However, analysis of social relations. Um, Sam, your connection is really poor right now for the last maybe 10 seconds. So you may want to just switch off your camera and try using just audio for a moment and then... Um, okay. Is this better now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. So maybe you want to go back um, about 10 seconds. Okay. Later. No. Okay, no problem. Sorry about that. So the conclusion that I want to draw from those readings of Althusser's two reflections on the ideology of work is that production is the concept that ties the two together. However, what I want to say is that given sociology's privileging of work and labor as theoretically humanist concepts, the separation between those two readings opens up and a theory of ideology predominates that forbids a materialist analysis of the social relations of work. Uh, with this argument, I don't mean to say that within the sociology of work, there is an explicit separation of these two specific texts. In fact, Louis Althusser is very rarely cited within the sociology of work at all. But in the instances where he is cited, what is evident is that the theory of ideology of work that is presented is the one that we find in the uh, text on the reproduction of capitalism. And it's this interpretation that is repeatedly dominant. So citing Althusser's essay on ideological state apparatuses, Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams describe the ways in which the contemporary ideologies of work are disseminated through the education system, where quotes for and in fact submission to the existing order and the skills necessary to distribute them along different segments of the labor market. Peter Fleming's analysis of ideo the ideology of work um, is grounded in the same text. And for Fleming, Quote, along with gender roles and class, work is one of the few ideological memes that are ready and waiting for their occupants before they are born. As the French Marxist Louis Althusser pointed out in his essay on ideological state apparatuses, this is what makes the interpolation process, his name for a particular kind of capitalist indoctrination, so effective. End of quote. So this particular theory of, of the ideology of work, constructed by Cernicek, Williams and Fleming, in their direct contact with Althusser's analysis of ideology in, on the reproduction of capitalism is found repeated elsewhere within the sociology of work, even if Althusser is not explicitly cited. So I claim that far from a simple conceptual choice, what this in fact demonstrates is the persistence of the separation of intellectual and manual labor within sociological thought, maintained by the centrality of the concepts of work and labor over production. The reason that this incomplete theory of ideology persists is because the question of subjectivity is already assumed with the use of the concepts of work and labor. The activity of work and labor are taken for granted, and as a result, so is the subject who does this work. The ideology of work within sociological discourse is therefore the false consciousness, the illusion, or the indoctrination which colors the consciousness of this worker and turns work as their immediate empirical contact with the real into a problem. It resurrects a theoretically humanist problematic, which denies a materialist understanding of the nature of work and labor in the first place. Knowledge of work and labor is assumed a priori, given by the existence of the human subject. Ideology emerges as the problem only to the extent to which it interrupts the consciousness of this subject in some way, misdirecting their relationship with the real in a way that produces the drudgery of work under contemporary capitalism. In assuming the knowledge of the concept of work, sociology can be said to separate these two texts apart and in doing so loses the concept that holds them together, production, and with it the material realities that bring this concept forth. The so-called material problem within the sociology of work is actually an idealist one of the human subject's relationship to their work 
and the way in which ideology interrupts or mystifies this relationship. The theory of the ideology of work produced by Althusser in the humanist controversy, which questions with greater consistency the problem of work and labour within knowledge itself, is missing from the sociology of work. And this is because the sociology of work turns conceptually on an understanding of work as praxis rather than production. It continues to privilege the separation of intellectual and manual labour, facilitated by the existence and centralization of the human subject within its considerations. The assumption of the existence of this subjectivity immediately closes off the possibility of production in thought, where the relationship between the subjective and the objective can only be considered as one media through work and labor. Production with it is the materialist analysis of work and labor under capitalism, grounded in the social relations that make it what it is. Thanks very much. So thank you for that um, remarkable discipline from all three of you on time. So now, um, because it is exactly two o'clock. So what we're gonna do now is for, take one round of questions from the, um, from the, uh, from the panelists. While um, they are doing that, I would really encourage people to start asking questions in the YouTube ch um, chat. And then um, we will, um, I, I will pose those same questions to our panelists so we can get some clarification. And uh, so let's go from there. So uh, the first person who will be asking a question will be Sam, then it'll be Tommy, and then it'll be Alia. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, sorry if my internet connection was a bit dodgy there. I hope I hope everything that came through. Um, so I've got a question for for Tommy based on your um, presentation, which was which was was excellent. Um, so obviously I'm the sociologist in the room, and I'm interested in the kind of um, references that you make towards sociology and the sociological reception of Balabar's thinking within this reading capital essay. So I wondered if you could say. A little bit more about maybe that reception and like how it had been, um, what that traditional reception looked like, and what and what and what your kind of critique of that is, and also about what you think the consequences of this concept of decollage could be for um, social scientific or, or sociological thought. Like, is this a principle that sociology would be capable of developing and using, or is it something that maybe like is incompatible with sociology and and perhaps like um poses even an existential threat to uh, to sociology as a discipline um i just wondered what your thoughts were on on this um next question is from tommy great uh thanks everyone for these great talks um really just incredible um i have my questions for for alia i'm reading it off so that i don't say something uh you know, particularly obtuse. Uh, I think your, your talk did a really uh, great job of exploring how the conceptualization of even like a nominally Marxist concept can prove to produce certain uh, deleterious effects when not contextualized within an appropriate network of ancillary concept. So do you think your talk at all implies that certain readings of the concept surplus value uh, for example, ones which take the concept as it appears in pre-Marxian political economy uncritically are by necessity bound to understandings of capital, which only mirror the appearance capital presents uh, as immediately obvious to the worker. Uh, this would be like contrary to, uh, for example, readings which understand the abstract nature of surplus value as fundamentally not reducible to pure quantifiable sums of labor time or accumulated profit or something like that. Thank you for that. And then Alia, your, your question. I also wrote down a question during Sam's talk because I my brain was exploding as I attempted to follow the granularity of the presentation. Um, and Sam, just before I say anything else, I'm desperately envious of your ability to effectively communicate the findings of highly theoretical scholarship without reducing its complexity. Um, and I did feel that our research shares some kinship in attempting to frame a productive encounter between ideology and critique and the work of critique. Um, so I, 
I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll leave my question fairly broad because I know that you've written a book and I'm sure that there's a lot to say. Um, and so uh, given your, your presentation and, and the, um, the, the, the tension that you know, is productive or not, depending on who you ask, I guess, and, and how the tension is investigated, um, how do you understand, if at all, um, the problem of this research that you have just presented um, as manifest within other dominant Marxist approaches to work? Um, and that can be either within you know, the sociology of work or given that you have indicated that the sociology of work doesn't explicitly or overwhelmingly uh, meaningfully um, work through the writings of Althusser, um, whether there's more indication that you might give um, as to the, the pervasiveness of this problematic. Great, thank you for those three questions. Um, again, a reminder, please do ask questions in the chat. Um, yeah, so the order of answering questions will be first Ta Tommy, then Alia, then Sam. Um, just when the other person finishes, ask the next question. Cool, I'll just uh, jump right in. So this is a, a very good question, Sam. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reception that I'm sure a lot of people who've been looking at Altsair, uh since like the 70s and 80s probably view as like a nightmare at least that's how it's always been conveyed to me and things i've read and, and conversations i've had where there are sort of these sociological debates in the anglophone literature specifically centered around balabar's essay that are all about you know the application of the concept of the mode of production to particular conjunctures and and uh and social formations uh or they're about you know uh whether we should even bother with the, the use of history. This is, you know, where we get sort of like the very famous uh, work of Hindus and Hearst, uh, which is almost like universally denounced by by people like, you know, E.P. Thompson. And it, it, what the problem with that reception is that it, it really did, it, it's one of those situations where the biggest debate over a text uh, involves both its uh, advocates and opponents getting it wrong and so <laughs> it, at least in my view and they end up arguing over things that don't have that much to do with the original text and i think that with the critique of models um that balabar very concretely has in his text in which mastere i think gives some life to with his epistemology i think what they both give us is the ability to go back and you know ironically they're very clear at the beginning that they're reading capital philosophically we can read reading capital in a philosophical way that relates to marx's critique of political economy we're not just talking about concepts that have nothing to do with the critique of political economy but at the same time we're not looking in the text for sort of a uh a hard and fast model of sociological application so i don't see them as really attacking sociology to court in in the text i, I think what they're doing is saying that look for certain kinds of sociological work to be done you need to have these underlying concepts um which are almost like implicitly uh a part of marx's work and what the misreading involved was taking these concepts which are almost supposed to be groundings or principles and turning them into models and so i think that any kind of and uh, you know i speak as as someone who is a philosopher and not a sociologist so i'm very loath to give any any substantial advice uh and would rightfully i think be left out of the room if i tried to do so um but i, I my basic thought is that um if we we're to go back or if sociologists are to go back and look at reading capital from a sociological perspective i'm sure there are new ways to read the text if we keep this kind of like qualification in mind and i can't speak to what results that might produce for a sociologist because i'm not one and don't know how to be one but um I think that with this kind of different lens, there are new avenues that would be that would be opened up. And I know that's a horribly ambiguous and qualifying answer, but hopefully it's it's uh, it's something at least. I appreciate your question as well, Tommy. Although clearly nobody's taking it easy on the the one panelist that's now in the next day. Let me just say, um, and so maybe what I'll attempt to do is is answer your question in parts in in potentially coherent statement that I hope will come together at the end in some kind of provisional response. Um, I think the, uh, God, do I think that certain readings of, a, of, a, of these concepts in a pre-Marxian time um, are, are by necessity given to this kind of uh, 
not illusion, but this ideological mirroring of reality. Um, I think while that is a generative question, I don't know that the answer is yes or no. I, I guess my recourse here would be to, you know, I said this was a fragmentary presentation because it is very, I'm very much in the midst of this. Um, and, you know, part of the, the thinking that I was doing in preparing this presentation and in this project is how uh, Altusser talks through um, uh, the question of generality, so generality is one, two, and three, um, and how we are to produce from a certain set of concepts and within a certain, uh, uh, what Foucault might call, you know, discourse, um, how we are to produce from that then scientific concepts. Um, and so, you know, by no means is my suggestion that we should, you know, consider the result of these concepts today and the knowledge effect of, of these concepts as deployed in capital as being static. Um, and I did separate the presentation that I um, made from an analysis of the conditions of production of those concepts, but um, it's almost ironic that you're the one asking this question, given that your presentation was on the history of conflict between concepts and, and this dislocation. Um, but I think that, you know, folks like uh, Smith, Mandeville, Hayek, Polanyi, Sismondi, um, I think uh, nowhere in capital uh, are they well, I suppose, you know, he does, Marx does kind of take his liberties, but I, I do also want to acknowledge that so much of Marx's analysis of, of political economy comes from the transformation of concepts that were given in the works of previous pre-Marxian political economists. So I guess the answer to the question is a yes and no. It's a, it's a synchrony diachrony game where, you know, the history of these concepts and the, the differing and, you know, even infinitesimally diff uh, deployments of these concepts is certainly uh, significant and should not be overlooked in, in the history of ideas and the history of philosophy. Um, but it seems to me that, uh, and I hope that this is what folks got from my presentation, is that uh, we need to be continuously interrogating uh, the concepts that we have on hand, that we have come to take as being scientific, um, without considering that there may be an alternate operation um, in the concepts we produce, simply because we are subjects uh, of a specific historical conjecture that exists in this specific way and not any other. And so we are subjects in this specific way and not in any other, and we have knowledge in this specific way and not in any other. Um, so that's my response, which is neither yes or no, but I think a really generative um, next step for, well, whatever this crazy group puts on next. <laughs> um, thanks very much for your question, Alia, and I think your presentation becomes even more impressive knowing that it was delivered across two, two different days, <laughs> leaving one day and entering another, so um, it, it, brilliant. Um, this is a really good question about the problem of this research within other um, Marxist sociologies um, of work. So um, within um, the uh, decollage issue, which I know that we, I think we've all uh, submitted something to, which hopefully will be out soon. Um, I've submitted a paper on, on this, which kind of tracks this problem of uh, a theoretical humanism within Marxist sociologies of work across a number of different contributions, some of them predictable, like uh, E.P. Thompson's historical sociology of work, but then to those as well that might be uh, less less often accused of this, including Harry Braverman's labour process theory, in which this kind of notion of uh, work as a subjective activity is reproduced in many ways um, in the work of uh, Hart and Negri and their kind of sociology of immaterial labour. Um, which might be the most heretical accusation actually to accuse them of theoretical humanism. And it's not to say that it's consistent all the way through, but to say that there are instances when it crops up and pr produces limitations. Um, and um, also um, Andre Gortz is th uh, thinking about the refusal of work as well, which is perhaps an easy accusation because today I don't think he would make any excuses for his um, theoretical humanism. Um, but we can also think about like, so one of the, in, in terms of the British left today, one of the predominant Marxist sociologies of work is of course like workers' inquiry uh, and this kind of like post um thinking, which, you know, um, tries to kind of rethink workerism. Um, and it was quite convenient that the New Socialist um, published um, a section from um, Althusser's Café, or what is to be done, in which he kind of um, critiques some of the kind of like workers' inquiry that was going on in the factories in Italy at the time. He kind of sort of offers this critique, which says, well, yeah, like, um, you know, the experiences of workers 
direct experiences of workers are important, but the, pr the privileging of these experiences often relies on a, a set of assumptions around like the relationship that workers share to their work and the kind of imminence of that relationship. And in fact, the work of theoretical preparation and political preparation of the militant for engaging with that conversation is quite often missing in some of these um, analyses. And I think that that is the, I think that is the question for sociology today and particularly political sociology is how is it doing the preparation for that sociological intervention it seems to me that some of these underlying assumptions are not being questioned and the the risk of this is that some of the material uh realities are being uh, are being missed um so i hope that was provocative enough uh, of an answer um so and and, and yeah th th thanks for the for the question Great. So I've been told that we have about 30 more minutes and we are getting questions in Fast and Furious. So what I'm going to quickly do is I'm going to ask the most general question first. This is because, well, and then there are two sets of more specific sets of questions for Sam and Tom. So um, the first specific question for Tom, for Tommy is, you mentioned that some of Mashare's analysis is very Hegelian in its broad strokes. What are some of the major works you take it to differ? And the, um, that's from Ben Wallace. Um, and the other question for you, Tommy, is from Amarjeet Singh, which is a, clarific a clarificatory question, which is the word decollage has been used by many people, sometimes with very meaning. What specificity um, do you have when you use this word? And um, for um, Sam, Ben Wallace asks, what are some of the methodological upshots that a consideration of ideology, such as you described, might entail for sociology writ large, if any? And then from GM Gushkarian, um, do you have anything um, to say about the relationship between what you said about production as an encounter and the concept of the encounter that's usually attributed to the quote unquote late Althusser. I mean, I would like to just say that since GM is here, we'd like to, I think all of us on this call would like to thank him for the uh, immense amount of work um, that he has put in over the last 20 years. Like for many of us, um, it's GM's uh, introductions, it's his um, sc scholarly work that he has done that has actually been made us possible for us to do our scholarship. So, um, I, I just can't stop but to just thank him for that. Um, and then finally, there's a question from S. Jones, which is, can someone speak more or at least comment on their understanding of contradiction as is understood through Althusser? How are they addressed through materialist lenses? Lens. So who would like to go first? And this isn't the reading group, so I can't answer these questions for you. So you have to do it. You have to. You have to picture. You're in charge. <laughs> Tommy, you unmuted yourself. So congratulations. I know. I've, I I made the classic mistake of of surrendering uh, by needing to fill the silence. Um, yeah, I'll try to be relatively quick so that we have time to get to these other great questions. And I would also like to echo everything uh, Drew said about. GM. It's very cool. Very cool to know that GM's in attendance. I, I will say that as someone who's read a lot of his translations. Um, so as to the Hegel question, it's interesting. I think that it's a little bit hard at times to, to say authoritatively where uh, the contents of reading capital and of Mashray stuff specifically tend to break. I think there is, I guess, a Kantian kind of tendency to maintain um, a certain kind of split between, uh, I guess, the real object and the object in thought or whatever. And I think that it's fair that I think, um, I believe there's a bit in, in Hegel contra sociology that makes this comment about Althusser to, to link sort of the project of reading capital to a kind of um, Kantian split between the real object and the, the object in thought. I think honestly though, you'd have to really, go through very carefully the text and and find every reference to Kant. And there are actually quite a few. I think Rancière's essay uses a lot of Kantian terminology uh, to really figure out to the extent to which they are interested in the Hegelian critique of Kant, because I do think that they are aware of it and are interested in it. And to what extent they think that maintaining this dichotomy is still useful. Um, that would be the main one. I think there are probably others, but I 
don't want to get wildly speculative and completely lose my, my train of thought. Um, as to the question about decollage, um, I think to, to be very schematic about what I was trying to convey about the concept in the presentation, I think it, it basically represents a couple related relationships for Mashere, epistemologically speaking. And I want to, there are, it's used in other contexts, but I wanted to focus specifically on the epistemological context here. It has to do with disparities between individual concepts, both internal to a specific science, but also between concepts that exist within multiple sciences or concepts that exist in a science, but also a kind of ideological discourse. So, you know, the reason I used fortune as an example is because at least Gramsci argues that Machiavelli kind of makes this early foray into political science uh, with the Prince and with his other works. Um, and he heavily relies on the con concept of fortune, but of course it's so different from, you know, how it's, portrayed in like Boethius's constellation of philosophy where fortune is sort of like this specter to be banished in favor of divine wisdom. But there's something between them that is shared. Um, and so I think the idea of decollage is to point out these disparities between concepts and how they're productive and also to point out how the sort of conflicts between conceptual, I guess, bodies of concepts, we might just say, between bodies of concepts and objective conditions um, play an active part in shaping uh, how science unravels and, and processes as well. Um, that's the basics of it. Um, I could, I, I don't want to get too much more into detail, but yeah. So Alia, would you like to have a shot at the anything or? I actually, uh, yes, perhaps. Um, yes, and I think, it. Oh God, I might even regret that I volunteered myself for this. Um, we're in response to the to S. Jones's question, uh, speaking more, at least commenting on the understanding of contradictions as understood to Walter Sayre um, and how they might be addressed through a materialist lens. Um, I, I suppose the materialist lens is, is one thing, but I, you know, I should preface this by saying, and, and I'm and I'm sure that I'm really dropping the ball on everyone here to say that my reading of Althusser is in is influenced by uh, a reading of Spinoza, um, and I and I find myself indebted in many ways to Spinoza. Everybody's laughing, isn't it great? Um, and so I I do think that you know part of the part of my understanding of contradiction is uh, precisely the um, and this is put perfectly in Natalia Romay's uh, uh, quotation, Sam, that I think you had mentioned, which is um, that this work in years in this work is a perseverance and thinking jointly that which cannot be joined. Um, and of course, since I've now quoted Derrida a few times, we've, you know, I've said the word ontic. Um, it's already out there that I'm, you know, I'm on some pharmacon trip. Um, and so I, you know, I guess I suppose what I'm trying to say is that uh, I think it would be one thing to think of contradiction uh, if one were approaching the problematic of contradiction through Althusser from a from a programmatic political perspective. Um, but given that is that that is not within uh, can I even see expertise as a PhD candidate? Um, but given that that's not within my field, as they say, um, I suppose what I can offer is is that I personally think of Althusser's work and and his legacy and you know the the legacy of symptomatic reading and the and the uptake and you know transgression of that symptomatic reading in many ways um, is precisely a way to hold in productive tension things that appear on the surface to be in contradiction. And even if they are in reality contradictory, um, the, the idea being that the work is to hold them together in their contradiction um, and to see what can be generated, uh, not only about the contradiction, but about how we perceive and, and cognitively appropriate that contradiction um, and you know, how that affects us and, and how it produces wider social effects. Um, and so I suppose that's my preliminary response. Um, but again, fragmentary research very much in the process. Yeah. Um, great, th thanks for these questions. Um, I was also, I'm, I'm glad that you said what you said earlier because I was gonna, if I had to offer any short reflections on contradiction, I was going to also cite Natalia Romay's book, which I think the, the centrality of like the concept of overdetermination, I think um, is really, really important for thinking through the concept of like contradiction within Althusserian uh, philosophy. So I, I would definitely recommend that as a, as a starting point. 
Um, so Ben asked the question about the methodological upshots of a theory of ideology, which is a great question. And I think um, I think we do. I think sociology would benefit from a rethinking of the concept of ideology. I think, ideology, I think this is what I was trying to get at, which is that within sociolo sociology, the theory of ideology, which we see reproduced most often, is this kind of very structuralist, very functionalist theory of ideology, which is not to accuse Althusser of those things, but which we which are, which are found in kind of more cursory readings of Althusser's ISA essay. Um, and um, I think that like given that constructivism has won out within the social sciences over positivism I think constructivism could stand to be kind of like updated and um, and re and rethought in a more materialist way um, with a revisiting of the concept of ideology as found through Althusser. I think Althusser is kind of missing within um, the social scientific canon um, quite significantly um and i've often thought when i was thinking about when i was when i was putting together this presentation to what extent this erasure of Althusser is part of that erasure that balabar talks about you know it's a deliberate erasure which is part and parcel of an attack on marxism within the social sciences itself because with this erasure becomes comes the erasure of social class class struggle and these kinds of concepts too so i think the methodological upshots of revisiting the theory of ideology could be quite significant for the social sciences and would be the the moment in which Marxism and Marxist sociologies could be like, you know, reinvigorated in that sense. Um, to GM Goshgarin's question, um, I think you're, this is an excellent question, which is likely to start a, a bit of a fight uh, between Drew and I, because I think that this idea of uh, production as an encounter and its relationship to the theory of the encounter in the later works is one of the continuities between the early works and the later works within Althusser, and I know that for Drew, uh, you like the uh, the notion that there is a, a distinct separation between them. But I think um, reading this in this way, I think there is a continuity, and I think also one of the continuities that it drags along with it is the idea of theoretical anti-humanism too. I think that theoretical anti-humanism survives in the later works of Althusser, thanks to um, concepts like this and the way in which the encounter. And production as an encounter of different social relations allows for the displacement of the subject. The important thing, I think, that uh, which I think you're absolutely right about, um, Drew, in the in, in the things that you've written, and we've got a, a great book from you to look forward to as well on this um, on this topic, um, is that what Althusser really thinks through in the later works is the notion of politics much more convincingly, I think. And um, I think when you have this concept of production as an encounter coupled with this kind of more sophisticated thought about politics, you get things like the analysis that he produces in um, Kafir in what is to be done where, you know, like there's a there's actually a, a, a political stake for thinking in this way. It's the way in which you can start to think about things like revolution and, and what social change will look like. And the consequences for this on political sociology are huge. Like this is exactly what some of those sociologists that I cited, like Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams and all of these people, they're trying to think about social change. They're trying to think about new social futures. Um, but if this, if this notion of production and this notion of production as an encounter of social relations is a decisively theoretically anti-humanist concept is missing, then we have to think through what the ramifications of that would be. And I, I think that they are as strong as they were when Althusser first pointed them out, like in, in four marks, the, the, the ramifications of this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that would be that would be my answer to those to those questions. I hope I've answered them fully enough. Yeah, no, those are, um, I would say that I'm moving away from it being a break and more. I'm going to just go move towards it being more of a torsion, but we'll talk about that at, um, at a different time. Um, I'm gonna. Um, I've got a bunch of questions. More one is from um, Amarjeet, which is for Sam, which is how do we understand the ideology of work vis-a-vis -vis reproduction of conditions of production and the emphasis on conditions. Um, then we have David uh, Marzella, who is asking Tommy, I'm partial to the Canguelham Masharay view on con scientific concepts, but what for you is materialist about this view since it seems to grant almost no importance to the quote unquote empirical? And then Paniotis um, Suteris is asking Sam a question, which is, um, what about the importance of apparatuses as terrain of antagonistic material practices and rituals in the articulation and reproduction of ideological forms 
including ideology of work, in the sense that emphasis on practices draws a line of demarcation with functionalism. And then I'm gonna ask a question of um, Alia. And, uh, and Alia is completely not ready for this. Um, and the, that is, um, you know, you, the um, sort of the intellectual landscape you're establishing is one which is kind of well-trodden in some ways. You know, you, you mentioned Saussure, you mentioned your Derrida phase you're going through, Althusser. Uh, and it seems to me that the, there was in sort of the Althusserian intellectual landscape, the project of like Cahier, uh, uh, the, the Cahier um, the analysis, um, you had that period, which then had a series of interventions around um, around the applicability of uh, sign and structure and play and all of those sort of debates around like, I mean, you know, people like Irigare and all of them are um, contributing to that project. However, there's also a tradition which I think Nathalie Rome has sort of been emphasizing a lot in her most recent book, which is one that I'm particularly interested in. That's Michel, that of Michel Pichot, who sort of introduces a kind of Althusserian discourse analysis, which um, breaks from Saussure and sort of, um, and, and you know, there's, um, his close collaborator, um, Francois Gade writes a book um, on Saussure, which is then public, translated in the, in the 1980s. I was kind of wondering if you could sort of speak to the kind of intellectual landscape that you're sort of deploying in your um, work um, and whether, and whether you're interested in some of these more like Althusserian things, or is this, and what could be possibly gained from revisiting some of these um, more like that sort of different trajectory out of the uh, um, out of Althusser students, which is sort of, in my opinion, Michel Pichot has largely not enjoyed the same kind of um, proliferation as others of Althusser students. Um, do you know uh, who wants to go first? I'll go first, if you like, uh, kick us off. Um, so excellent questions. Uh, Amajit, thank you for your question about uh, the conditions of production and how ideology of, how the ideology of work works in relation to the reproduction of the conditions of production. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting question and one of the lines of thought that I have been, that I've often sort of thought about is the relationship between um, like Althusser and sort of Marxist feminist um, theories of uh, reproduction, um, including those of sort of Silvia Federici and, and, and others and, and the ways in which um, this idea of an ideology of work kind of fits in with that. Because I think that one of the things that is produced within sort of Federici's work is like, there is this kind of closure of the gap between uh, sort of intellectual and manual labor in a sense that like the way in which work is thought about the way in which work is represented um, and this links to um, what Alia was talking about in her talk too and, and the ways in which like things like surplus value are, are sort of like discursively represented in a sense is reflected in like existing exploitation and the existing devaluation of certain types of work and certain types of reproduction in a very complicated and, and, and quite complex way. Um, so I think that this, this idea of the relationship between reproduction and ideology does need to be thought about with much greater sophistication than it already is. I think that the tendency is to simplify this reproduction down to um, a simple um, indoctrination or brainwashing of, of subjects in a certain way. I think within the sociology of work in particular, work is a problem insofar as the conditions of, of the, reprodu the reproduction of the conditions of work are in a sense those, you know, always found in the ways in which subjects are continually reproduced as working subjects in, in the sense of being dominated more so than actually thinking about the intricacies of of what it means to reproduce a working subject. And obviously the Marxist feminist um, perspective answers this question with much greater sophistication and says that actually this is related to a, a much broader set of gendered um, exploitations rather than just this kind of like domination of the, 
subjective will to labor or whatever um so i don't know if that answers the question but i i, I think it's, 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 it's a really important question uh, and panagotis thanks for your question and um and thanks also for the book that you wrote as well which was um, really excellent and really instructive and uh, i enjoyed it a lot um in terms of the importance of apparatuses as a terrain of antagonistic material practices and rituals that articulate ideological forms i think this is important for the same reasons that i was just talking about i think that if you have if you answer this question first about how work is thought about and what work is in terms of a set of social relations then you understand it as a set of antagonistic practices an ensemble of antagonistic practices which then gives you the kind of ability to interpret apparatuses as this very um, encounter between those antagonistic practices Again, it's like within sociology, with there's this interpretation that actually, like, um, ideology isn't that isn't really an antagonistic force. It's a it's almost a force of domination which impresses itself upon people without, and the the kind of um, the, the the reality of the of, of class conflict of conflict that exists within that reality is missing. And I think it's because you know work itself, to to use the example that I'm I'm talking about work itself is not necessarily treated as a site of antagonistic practices. It's treated as a site of the domination of a, a subject through the alienation of that subject from their, you know, species essence or however you'd like to describe it. Class struggle disappears from the, from the discussion entirely and is only ever resurrected within kind of like very empirical social policy discussions around, uh, you know, industrial relations or whatever. Um, so I think it is necessary to kind of think about antagonism. And I think that comes back to the question that was asked earlier as well about the relationship of, uh, of contradiction to Althusser's thinking. I think it's really important to start thinking these things together for that reason. Um, so yeah, I, I hope I've answered those with some, with some clarity. So we've seen with uh, the, the mess of a million can of, cans of worms that Vuva decided to foist upon me at 106 a.m. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll begin with the second part of your question, uh, because a little bit unfair of you to ask me about Peugeot Duv when we're, we're set to talk about that very soon. Um, but I did actually, uh, when I was writing this paper, think very carefully about um, the nature of the semiotic intervention and the, and the, the nature of the semiotic um, body of literature that I was entering. Uh, and, you know, Saussure is, of course, the, the most well-known and perhaps the most um, well-cited in that sense. Um, but I have been reading very closely, not only Pichot, but also folks like Peirce, um, Julian Gramas, Yuri Lotman, um, all of whom have produced extremely generative and, um, well, just fun to read works about, you know, the operation of language and, and how it works in reality. Um, and given that, once again, my reading is informed by Spinoza, I, you know, I'm not willing to discount. Um, in fact, I, I couldn't discount that um, there is not a, a certain compatibility between, uh, a, a, you know, what might what one might call a purely discursive or purely on the level of thought, um, narrative semiotics or, you know, semiotics of philosophy, as well as um, a semiotic theory that also deals in, in material affects. Um, and in fact, maybe the, the point is that they they are coextent. Um, so I suppose my my response to the the your second the second part of your question about Peixot, um is that I have yet to develop the the more closely semiotic section of this research. Um, but I'm always uh, I'm always cautious to to mix fields, which is say to move from the philosophy of history to semiotics and jump around and. and Apparently, it's not very, it's not well looked upon, even though it's very fun, um, particularly as a grad student, I'm just reading everything. Um, and in response to your first question, um, I do agree that this intellectual landscape is well trodden. In fact, it seems almost like there's an excess of intellectual production around this very question, this very problematic of how ideology and critique interact and manifest um, and, and how they're imbricated in the work of critique. Um, and obviously the Calle Juan Elise, as well as, the, as, well as um, Derrida's very well-known science structure play, um, have not only been read multiple times, taught multiple times, overwrought to death, maybe. Um, but I do think, and, and this is, primarily because this presentation is uh, in service of, of the larger dissertation project, with, which takes on a more kind of traditional lit comp lit um, novelistic bent, um, we all get to get hired, you know, um, is that I would I would revisit these conceptual problematics, um, given that my broader dissertation project is about the comparative narrative semiotics of 19th and 21st century labor uh, historical social novels, um, which is to say that 
I'm working through a, uh, you know, a preliminary argument that says that, you know, around this moment of explosion of conceptual production in the 19th century around the capitalist mode of production and the critique of political economy, there was at the same time con concomitantly, though may not, uh, though may not have been um, actively acknowledged as being a conceptual production, um, uh, an oblique production of knowledges in, in forms that are not bound by the propositional nature of, of um, philosophy, which, you know, at the time also post-enlightenment guided by reason, the, the principles of reason, the, the you know, uh, vulgar empiricism almost, although I won't say that about anybody. Um, and so all of this is in, is in, you know, the service of moving towards some kind of uh, reading of these novels um, that excavates for us precisely because they are presented in different semiotic forms um, that, that are uh, moved by different uh, modes of cognitive appropriation that actually allow us to excavate obliquely information that would maybe not have been legible given the close immigration of ideology and critique. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, very specifically about Spinoza's three kinds of knowledge in, in this, and that heavily influences this distinction for me. Um, but I also, and you know, who knows how these pieces are going to come together, um, is that this research has always also been geared um, toward producing a, a kind of imminent understanding of the value form. Um, and, you know, again, in this decollage issue that, that all of us have uh, magically somehow ended up in, um, I, ha I do have a, an article uh, forthcoming that, uh, you know, kind of walks through what I think would be an imminent expressive in the Deleuzian sense, uh, understanding of the value form. And, you know, this is not just because uh, the value form is, of course, enticing to a third year PhD candidate um, who reads Marx, of course. Um, but also because, you know, given the, the prevalence of Neue Marx Lectura uh, work and, and the fact that um, Michael Heinrich is just one of the most generative writers uh, that I know about the value form, um, especially on the, the Hegelian Marxist, the left Marxist, whatever you want to call it, side of things. Um, I found it challenging to, to do that work while not having an understanding of the value form that is not a labor theory of value or that is not so on, so on, so on. Um, so there's many steps and many moving parts. And the hope is that, you know, these smaller, hopefully rigorous interventions allows me to piece together a, a more, you know, coherent understanding of the complex totality that is the mode of production. Um, but aside from that, I like to try things out. Um, I like to work through things on my own. I'm just stubborn like that. I'll be in this, this is this is the job, right? To think and to think as much as possible and as widely as possible and to make your mind up and then change it again. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I got. Tommy. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on to, these answers have been so great from everybody, by the way, I'll try to say something half of as uh, interesting as that. Um, <laughs> but the question from, from David Maritzella, by the way, everyone who is interested at all in epistemology and Althusser, track down David Maritzella's essays, read them. They're very good. They engage very, very, very rigorously with um, the history of French epistemology and Althusser. And certainly whatever's good in this presentation would not have been possible without reading his stuff. Um, but no, I, I think that you make a good point that um, it almost seems like, and, it, and this kind of relates a little bit to, to Sam's question, I think, to some degree, where, where it's possible to view what Mashre uh, is doing by drawing on Kangalam here as almost like a critique of, of social science uh, if, if you're not trying to turn it into a social science, right, which was the original mistake. But I don't think that's, I think, I think what makes this effort at least materialist in name is that I say there's two factors. The first would be that in Mashray's view, what Marx is doing in Capital requires a great deal of empirical work. And if they didn't say that, I mean, anyone who's read Capital knows that, of course. Um, but it, the, what is so unique about Capital for Mashray, uh, volume one specifically, I think, um, because he's writing on the first few really pages of, of volume one, this essay. What's interesting is how it mediates these different forms of research in such a way as the final product of capital doesn't really 
exist as it does without all three of them interacting with each other in often o openly antagonistic ways. Um, and I think that empirical concepts, you know, have a really serious role to play in this. I, I think that probably smartly, uh, Montre doesn't try to discuss them um, because Balabar kind of dips his toe in that and it didn't turn out great for him <laughs> in terms of the reception. Um, I think the, the essay itself is excellent, but I think in terms of the way it was read, Balabar's essay it was almost punished in a sense. Um, but I think just because he's not focusing on specific empirical concepts doesn't mean he doesn't think that they have a role or that immediate experience doesn't have a role. In terms of how materialist the text is in terms of you know positing an existing material world that's exterior to our experience, I think that Mastery's essay is actually one of the ones in reading Capital that does this the least explicitly. I think Althusser and at, at points Balbar are pretty explicit about this being their position. But I think that the way that Mashray tends to conflate the term objective with the term material indicates that he's pretty much in line with Althusser and Balbar on this uh, problem. Um, you know, we, we can later, uh, we can email and have some long discussion about, you know, the the philosophical solidity of terms like materialism and idealism and then go on and on about how this relates to Hegel and Kant and whatever. But I think ultimately, in terms of just the terminological choices that Mashray makes, there's an indication that he's following from uh, Althusser's basic like materialist positing in his essays uh, on this. So it's not explicit, but I think it's because Mashray's project is specific and he's not trying to necessarily delve too much into explicit discussions of the material. Um, hopefully that's not too dodgy an answer. So that is our time. I would like to thank Tommy, Alia, and Sam for their wonderful presentations and their questions. I'd like to thank everyone who came on today um, and um, participated for coming. Um, I would like to also extend an invitation because I think it's been alluded a few times. We do um, the, uh, what we jokingly call the Altazer Support Group is a group of uh, um, scholars from around the world who are doing this research together. We're not, we help each other. We cite each other apparently a fair bit and we are full of positivity as you can tell. Um, but we do, um, we do a pretty systematic reading of figures uh, that maybe that's the nicest way to put it. So we right now we've been doing a two year reading group around ba Balibar and Mashare. And um, we are currently in the middle of doing one around the Calle Poir Analyse. Um, and then what Alia was sort of gesturing towards is that there will be a new sequence or a new a group which we're just going to be starting in the fall, which will be around Michel Pichot's project. So we will be reading as much of that stuff out in, um, as possible. We will be trying to translate some stuff. So if you're really interested in sort of getting involved with us, where you know, just reach out to us. We're not. We're not, this is not the um, 1970s where, you know, um, there's the in-group. We are pretty outgoing. You're, we're um, very welcoming. So please uh, reach out to us. And, you know, we, we and I think all three of us, all four of us feel this way. Like, it's really great to see that 30, 30, 30 to 50 people came for this. And, um, and we really look forward to seeing what you produce in the coming years around Altazare and um, keeping this community alive. And I would like to thank HM. I would like to thank Paul at HM, who has been our tech guy for today. If it hadn't been for Paul, we would be looking at each other like clowns. And so we really do um, appreciate everything. Um, as I said before, please get your library to subscribe to the journal. Please get your library to order the HM books. These are really important.